ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, corn dog lovers of all ages, welcome to In the Box with your hosts, Matt and Adam. And Geo. Everybody get. Good evening, MASL family. Good uh, evening. In the box live on a special Tuesday night, uh, August, what is it, 31st? It Last day of August. Right. Special guest, Mr. Keith Tozer. I won't go through, so Philly went through all the accolades you have, and I don't remember all those. Uh, I don't want to embarrass you too much, but uh, you've had a couple of records in your career, I would say. Uh, I would say we. I, you, I, you know, in all those games, I've never won one of them. I was blessed to have so many great players, blessed to have so many great assistant coaches, front office people, and owners and fans. So it, you, you guys know to win a championship, it takes it, it takes a large group to do things and a little bit of luck. So, But I've been surely blessed in this sport. That's awesome. So thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Glad we're finally able to get schedules to align. I've been working with, uh, with Pete to try to figure out a Monday night will work or a Friday here and Tuesday and Matt was running around crazy all day today and almost didn't make it. So glad to have you. That's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to uh, listening and talking and promoting. Yeah. yeah this, so, <laughs> this interview was one that I've been waiting for. I've been waiting to talk to you for, for years. So this is truly an honor. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm on board with them. I'm just going to jump on that boat. But yeah, Keith, thank you for joining us. And it's going to be awesome. I'll copy it. Gio, to hear that from a Blast fan. Wow. That's <laughs> like, I just got the, I got the chills because let me tell you, we, we had so many great battles in Baltimore and so many other cities. And it's all out of respect. And boy, we really had to do our homework, really had to get the guys up. Boy, it's there, there have some, been some great games in indoor, and a lot of them have been in Baltimore and in some other cities, obviously. No, I appreciate that. You, you can just say the blast and ignore the rest. It's fine. <laughs> I've had some great some great memories in so many different buildings. Yeah, I'm sure you have. With, with, your, with your resume, I'm sure you have. Well, uh, you know, the sport is fantastic. That's why Shep. JP and I are, are back into it. We we never really kind of left it, you know. It's kind of like it was always there. You're always talking to people. You're always watching it. You're 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 always thinking about it. You know, we we were always there. So to, to be back in it and to be back with some good friends of mine for so many years uh, to you know help grow this thing. It's re it's really been uh, a lot of fun actually. We talked to JP two weeks ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said this then, I, I really love the idea of having a, like the triumvirate or the Illuminati or whatever, the big three, I think we called it. Um, because I there, there are things that like me as a fan would look at differently than what Gio as a fan would look at differently than what owner ABC over here would look and or XYZ would look at. I think to have someone dedicated to, like the, for me, the broadcasts are a big thing to, you know, the media, and have someone else to get involved in the sponsorships. And then, of course, to have you really run the league. To ask one person to do all that, I think, was kind of unfair in the past. I like the idea of having the three of you on and uh, as commissioner. So let's jump into some questions here. Um, hey, can I can I say something about yeah, that, Adam? Yeah, definitely. You know, in the old days, a lot of it was like assembly line stuff. So, you know, I would take my part and I'd pass it on to you, Adam, and you would put something on. He'd pass it on to Gino, a Gio, and Gio would put some and give it to Matt, and then it'd all be finished. In the past 20 years, multifunctional has really been like a key word in business. You know, you got to be able to do more than just one part of your job. However, if you got too many of those, you can't do them all good, and some mm -hmm. you're going to fail. To have this role and the responsibilities, for one person to do it, I think you're setting up for failure. I mean, Josh and, and John doing this all by themselves. To break this bucket up in the three different areas with JP's expertise one way 
and Shep's expertise in another and mine, and we cross over, mm-hmm. and we're we're kind of making everybody feel like they're part of the solution and not part of the problem. I, I think that's the key. So uh, really excited. It, we we would not have gone into this if it wasn't for us three. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, yeah. When when we found out it was the the three of you, uh, I mean. Uh, you guys have a long list of like accolades and it was, it was angel singing because you guys know what's going on in the sport. Like you've been there, you've done that. Like it it was, it was perfect in in my opinion. Yeah. And and Matt, you know what, you know what I think is really cool. Um, I remember going to the Meadowlands and watching Shep play you know, with Pele and Beckenbauer and Carlos Alberto and all those guys. Then all of a sudden, I'm 20 years old and I'm playing the Nassau Coliseum, my first game against Shep. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. And then a couple of years later, I'm playing for the Pittsburgh Spirit and JP is working in the front office in sales. And he's gone on to have an unbelievable career. But what those two guys bring with with so many other things is we have all done a great job marketing our own teams. I mean, great job in our own city, our own state. I think bringing JP and Shep on, I think our role is to market not only in the United States, but North America because of our members in Mexico and hopefully in Canada. So to have those guys and who they are, I I think is going to really help immensely. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Jeff. It's interesting. It's interesting. I don't know if I should hold off on this, but it's interesting you talk about like the branding and the marketing aspect because that's that for personally, that's something huge for me. Like I see some teams that do it very well and some teams that could improve a lot drastically. (laughs) But it's just like, you know, it's really important. People some teams don't realize how important even just social media is, right? That's free advertisement in a sense, especially if you get your community behind you and then they engage with you, they share your posts, stuff like that. It's so important. I, and I guess my question would be, how would you guys either incentivize or get everyone on board to do that? Well, I, I love the fact that you said social media because done correctly, it is a huge, powerful tool. I mean, you know, I have my own podcast, right? right. Uh, World of Futsal. I started with my four kids, you know, and then like two weeks later, I had like 500 people. I'm like, wow, 500 people is pretty cool. And then it was a thousand. Then it was 10,000. Then it was a hundred thousand. Then it was 200,000. And we're all over a quarter of a million. And it was just me, basically, uh, along with Allison Phillips just sharing it everywhere we can and, and putting it out. And, and I think collectively, if we do that as a league and, and we bring other people in, um, I think we can really grow it quick. Um, we don't call them minimal standards now, minimum standards. We call them professional standards. And one thing that we added to the league this year, which has never been done before, is compliance officers. So there will be one person in each city, not a member of that team, that – We'll go to that game and we'll have a laundry list of was the music good? Was the music loud? Was the music too loud? How was the locker rooms? How was the field set up? Did they come out on time? Did they do everything? And teams are going to have to follow that. And and if they follow that, that's fantastic. And and this can't be just 10 out of the the, the amount of teams we have. It's got to be every team. So every day we keep looking, how do we help our members, which are the owners, how do we help them grow the game, not only in their own market, but in North America? So it's going to be exciting. So how can I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They'll be able to go to the website soon. So we'll have one in each city. And, and, awesome. it, and it's going to be great. And mm-hmm. we're talking about possibly having an app so they go there and everything they can put down or automatically will go into a portal and then we'll work from there. That's really awesome because I think I think that holds the teams accountable, but in the long run and a short run, it's going to be beneficial to them if they meet those standards. Because if we want to carry ourselves like a professional league, we got to have standards. That's like one thing that I, I think me, Adam and Matt have talked about is like, how can the teams play in the same league would be like this? 
You know, it's yeah. it's not. Yeah. And that's a good point. And it, it's not good cop, bad cop. We're not being bad cop and saying, oh, my God, right. we don't want to find anybody. What we right. want to do. And, and when people came to Milwaukee um, and, and somebody I remember, I forget the player that we just came back from the visiting team and the locker room. They didn't have this, that and that. And they said, hey, coach, hey, Larry Sales, let's not do our locker room is so good for the visiting team. Let's let's take something away and go. No, no, no. That's not how we do. It. That's not how we do it. We want people to come here. And one of the reasons, by the way, that we did that is we wanted the players to come to Milwaukee and say, oh, my gosh, they're so professional. When I become a free agent, I want to go to Milwaukee. So we're out there to help our members in everything. It's called sweating the details. I mean, mm -hmm. one day I was out to dinner and I loved the valet parking. So all of a sudden we came up with the idea at the Wave Summer Camps. Hey, Parents drop their kids off at camp. They got to walk all the way out to the field. They got to kiss Mary and Johnny goodbye. Got to walk all the way back. I said, you know what? We're going to put uh, cones in the parking lot. And when you drive up, we're going to have Victor Nagara and Greg House and Todd Isoski. They're going to be valet parkers. And people could come up, open the door. How you doing? Kid, kid, Johnny and Mary gets out and they off on their way to work. And that costs zero money. We call it sweating the details. And if I was out in a grocery store or at a cocktail party, people go, hey, by the way, I love your kids. But the valet parking was awesome. <laughs> Just little things like that that makes good to great. It really makes this sport. We've always been talking about the the thing that sets this sport aside, uh, you know, aside from any other sport that I'm, I'm aware of is the, the personal connections. Um, we we It was my daughter that got us into uh, – doing season tickets because she went to, we, we were looking for a wave camp for, or a camp for her. We chose wave camp. We'd gone to a couple of games the season prior and she went and it was, uh, it was Everton and Tenzin and uh, Nick Vorberg and Marcel and just instant connection. And then I'm like, Oh, we can, I can friend these guys on Facebook and I'm kind of fanboying a little bit myself. And we've actually made legitimate friendships over the years with a number of players, a number of people from teams, both our own team and other teams, you know, Matt and I went to, um, Kansas City in, in December for the All-Star game and got, you know, more like actual friendships from, with people. And it's just a, I don't think you get that in other sports. You get, you know, well, let's wait in line for two hours to get Aaron Rodgers to sign something for 50 bucks or whatever. Um, now, granted, the lines after the, you know, autograph lines can be kind of crazy after a game, but it's still, you can walk up to a player and shake their hand and walk off and not, you know, and, and they'll remember you and they'll, they'll mention something about you or, you know, something like that. So, I think we got so many great players and coaches in the league that mm -hmm. love to get back to remember who they were, where they came from, where they are, where they're going, and, and to sign some young person's shirt or hat or ball or an adult. I, I think it's an amazing thing. It, I always loved it. I would stay to the end. I know all the players and every team uh, in our league love to do it, and they do it genuine. And uh, – I, I know fans love that. I mean, it's kind of like walking in the restaurant, right? If you walk in the restaurant and the owner says, hey, Matt, how you doing? Gio, hey, Adam, how you doing? And he he, he knows you, not not like really great, but he knows your name. and everything. How do you feel? You feel like, wow. And if you're with somebody that doesn't know the guy, they're like, hey, you're pretty important. So <laughs> I, 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 love, I, I love that feel. And, and we have it in each one of our cities, and we'll continue to do that. Let's get. We, we had a number of questions in the group, and I had a bunch written down. I'm sure Matt and Gio have some, mm -hmm. um, and we have one important one. We got to make make sure we get to. Uh, so Steve Squires is the uh, he sits right next to the penalty box in the first row, right across from the team benches, and he's been there for a number of years. Uh, team photographer uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, one of his questions was, "What what's your primary focus?" If you had to pick one thing, and I, I know the answer to this because we talked to JP and there is no one thing, but if you had to pick one thing you wanted to emphasize, what would that one thing be? Oh, my gosh, that's such a broad question. Um, we need everybody involved in the sport to talk positive about this sport. We need everybody involved in the sport to be patient as we try to change the culture and the system. We need everybody's help moving forward to do that. Uh Whenever I took over a team or one of my players became a coach, I always said, get a three-year deal. Because your first year, you're basically evaluating what you have and who you have. So let's say you got 20 players. At the end of that first year, you, you won half your games. 
and you got 12 guys that you think are really good. You bring in eight more. You find four guys. Now you're up to 16. By the third year, you should have everything in order, and a coach needs to change the culture of the franchise and what the system is. And I think that's what's going to happen here is that what JP probably said is we have to look from A to Z. And if we can improve 25% in all those areas that we're doing, then going into the second year, I think we're even going to be better. And, and, and there's a lot of great things that the members have done and coaches and players and fans have done. And, and we're, we're not saying we're taking a shovel and flipping it over. We're, sh- we're saying, okay, your foundation is here. How can we move it forward? And how can we move it forward altogether? So there are so many things. Uh, for instance, I, every time I go to the coaches convention, which is the largest coaches convention in the world, um, there was never anything about indoor soccer. Well, we're going to be a big presence there for three days. Uh, we've been talking about going back to U.S. soccer. Uh, we've been talking about maybe making some rule changes. There's just so many things out there that we're taking a look at. And by the way, we are not making quick decisions passionately. We are doing our due diligence in everything and every decision that we need to make so that we hopefully will make the right decision. Now, are we going to make a wrong decision here and there? There is no question. But you know what? We're all big guys and we can look ourselves in the mirror and say, okay, we made a mistake. We're going to learn from it and we're going to move on. Yeah, I don't think you can please. You know the fans in this sport more than, probably more than anyone. You're not going to please everyone. Uh, I know there's fans that are already kind of getting uh, restless because there hasn't been this big, giant, magical thing that's been done. Uh, and, I, yeah, I, I we've been kind of talking like – like, let these guys come in, let them do their thing. Let's sit back, watch what happens, and uh, and we can pick on little things here and there because that's kind of the nature of sports fans. But just looking for, I, I'm looking forward to a regular season again. After please the be patient and mm-hmm. please be positive. And you know what? Give all the fans who came during COVID because that wasn't an easy thing for to do for families with children to go into arena and watch their favorite player play or their favorite coach direct. It, I mean, it was a pandemic. Give the owners a lot of credit. Oh yeah. Who decided to play. Give the players a ton of credit who again went out there in airplanes and cars and buses and however they got there. I mean, it was remarkable what they did. And so hopefully we're somewhere on the other side of the epicenter so that we can bring the great sport back to all the people who really love it. You know, you know, speaking, I know this is going to be a tough question and maybe one you might not be able to answer, but let's say some protocols do roll back into place. What kind of contingencies do you guys have in mind? Maybe not set in stone, but maybe to take take that on. Well, we've been working very hard on the uh, schedule. We actually partnered with a guy named Paul Lahofsky who's been helping John Raymond with the schedule. He's got a rich history of indoor soccer, understands back-to-back games, understands travel. Uh, And and some of our plans are, you know, do we roll out half the season schedule just to see what happens? Uh, We will have contingency plans in case something happens. As, as, As deep, Geo, as even thinking about if we get into the middle part of the year, does it go to a bubble? Okay. Uh, we're talking to some some leading doctors of what we can do. When I was the national team coach for 20 years, when we'd go on a trip, we we would put all the players on one hallway and we would have mm. security at the end of each hallway. So we have asked all the members to make sure the host hotel puts all the players, hopefully with no guests, all on one hallway. We go to the same restaurant. We're doing the same protocol. So we're taking everything we possibly can to make sure our fans, our players, our referees, our coaches uh, are all safe and sound. It's awesome to hear. Uh, I have two. So I have a number of questions that I that I want to uh, want to throw in here. I just want to make sure we cover. There's a lot. I think there's a lot that I think are probably aren't fair to you right now to ask. But we'll get we'll get you on later on as the season goes in or maybe into January. Um, this is a twenty second timeout. <laughs> So time, hang on, real quick, just for Eric Berger's sake, we'll just okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
the, there's a lot of talk around this sport about visa players. And I know you were very instrumental in uh, going to Brazil and bringing in kind of the, almost the first wave of, of indoor players from Brazil or first player, first wave of Brazil players to indoor. Uh, and now with all the weird visa rules and um, things that go on, especially travel bans and everything, I, I know there's no easy answer to this, but what can what can the league do? What can the teams do? What can the fan, what, what can we help with uh, to try to resolve these visa player issues? We have a number of players that are like making life decisions on whether I can stay in the U.S. or whether I have to move back to homeland or what I want to do. And, and I think visas are kind of... Uh, I don't want to say ruining that, but kind of ruining that. (laughs) Well, before I get into that, let's first talk about that door opening to Brazil was Tattoo. I mean, and Tattoo was just fabulous, right? He was fabulous sidekicks. He was fabulous, you know, playing everywhere. Uh, Then Neto came to Baltimore, okay? Uh, And we all know what a great player he was. And then, as you said, Adam, Marcio Leite, uh, Luan, Chico, Pablo, Pablo is now assistant coach with the futsal national team. Uh, Jonathan Santos. Th- those guys were really important because I was trying to blend two methodologies together, right? In indoor and futsal. So we've had a rich history of Brazilian players uh, in the past now. And, and I know in the future, um, you know, the white house is really important to some of these decisions. Obviously, when when President Trump was in the White House, things got a little bit tighter. Now things are changing with uh, the the new uh, the President Biden. Um, we are working diligently uh, with our two immigration lawyers now. Before, a lot of the teams were doing their own immigration stuff, anywhere from doing it on their own or a local lawyer. You know, when when you have some issues with immigration. Um, it, it can be very sticky. So what one of the first things we did was we got it down to two immigration lawyers that all the members have to use. So it's one or the other. Then we had to work on documents. And, and the documents was asking people in, in high places, be it an executive or a coach or a manager in maybe different sports like the NBA, would they write a letter saying how great they think the sport is internationally? Uh, Like Mark Rogandino. Mark uh, has been the Clippers and the Anaheim Ducks, and he wrote a great letter, okay, to help us with immigration. So we've been really working on a daily basis, again today, John Raymond and myself, is how do we really help the visa process? So a young man can come into this country feel comfortable that he could stay here, get the visa done quickly uh, to help all our members uh, do that. So we've been really working hard from really day one since we've been into the office of really trying to streamline the visa issue. We know international players are extremely important to to the league as well as American players. But, you know, the the players from around the world have played a big part from day one in the sport as well as the American players, and we're trying to help them in every way we can. Because you know what? Every city that has had an indoor team and had an international player, so many of them have stayed there, have met women there, have had children, gone to church, and have been great role models in the years after they've done playing. And that's a big part of why indoor soccer has been so great for so many years. Agreed. For for the record, that that John Raymond guy's trouble. I'm, I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I got to tell you, because John will listen to this. Yeah, he will. It, it's, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing what that guy does in one given day, because he works with me, then he works with Chef, then he works with JP, then he works with all three of us, then he's working with the individual members. Uh, he's working with Ryan Sigich, who's done a fabulous job with the referee program, and we're so happy uh, about our referee program. I mean, John, John. I mean, there are some people who thought, well, I don't know. Let me tell you, all-star player, all-pro player. Yep, I agree. Um, do you have a hard stop at eight, by the way, please? No, come on. You know I'd love to. Okay, well, I, well so <laughs> I, just so you know what you're getting yourself into <clears> – <throat> I, I, I love the talk and I love indoor and I, I, I love soccer. I love futsal and, and I love 
I love this challenge. Yeah. And, and, and you know, JP, Shep, and I, we sat down and talked to each other. He said, look at, we're putting our reputations on the line. And we all said, you know what? We're hard workers. We're connected. Uh, we were passionate. We love it. And we think, I mean, all of us, I would go to the bank and get per diem. I put together the itineraries. I drove vans. I mean, we're talking about, you know, working in a factory as an intern and working all the way up. So no, we're good to go. Want to talk? Keep talking. Yeah, just warning you, we've had, uh, so we started the show. Uh, it was Matt's yeah. idea to start in the box. Uh, and then when COVID hit, Matt was going to go over like once a week, dude, just to take a team from the season that got canceled and go over it. Well, the wave was the second team we went over and he invited me to do it. And he's just like, you want to do this every week? And sure. And here we are. So we've had four hour shows before. We're not doing that tonight. I guarantee it. Okay. Uh, but I just want to make sure that, that we don't, we don't have to cut you off in the middle of a question or anything for a time limit. Uh, I like to have these more as you, you probably have been able to tell. I like to have conversations in our shows and not just a strict list of question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Uh, just cause I think it's, it's a little more, it, there, there's certainly a good place for those. Uh, like Philly's interviews are great because he gets, you know, to the point we get questions answered. You get the information you want out, you know, important. Uh, but I like just having the conversation. In fact, there, there's a, there's something behind you there that I want to ask you no. about. And this question hasn't been set up in advance at all. So don't worry about that. This is pretty off the top of my head. The three glass balls. No, three, no, no, no. We, we don't talk about those jerseys. Those jerseys. Okay. Are, well, yeah. So, so here, Alec, Alec Marshke is a blast fan. He said as a blast fan, does he, he meaning you, Keith, does he yeah. ex seriously expect my support after all the headaches he caused us over the years? And I said, should I ask him about field size? And he says, I retract my earlier question. So <laughs> we have that. But uh, you had mentioned the, the there's three glass balls behind you on the second shelf over your left shoulder. Yeah. What, uh, what's the story behind those? When, when Victor Nagara and you know Victor played for 10 or 11 years here uh, in Milwaukee. And actually, when I came here in 1992, uh, the second year, 93, there was a dispersal draft. Mm -hmm. And I believe we had the third pick, Milwaukee. And the owner said, who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick Zoran Carrick? Are you Are going to pick Hector Marinero? Well, Hector played for me in Los Angeles, so I knew Hector very well. And I said, uh, they'll probably go one, two. I said, I'm going to take Victor Nagara. And at that time, 92, 93, Victor was the starting keeper for the U.S. Futsal men's national team and was going to play in Japan uh, in the World Cup. And you were going to miss him for the first eight games. Mm. Uh, so I really thought that maybe the two teams before us, might even have been three teams before us, that they would take Victor. I mean, Victor is Victor. So the first pick came, I believe it's Hector, second pick Zorn, third pick was someone else. And my owner said, I don't think you should take him. He's going to he's going to miss the first eight games. I said, with all respect, I'm not picking Victor for eight games. I'm picking Victor for 10 years. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, I think we started off that season one in seven before Victor <laughs> came back. And we finished at 500, and that was the only time in the next 23 years that we ever even got close to 500. So Victor, as he got older in his career, he wanted to go back to San Diego. <clears throat> and obviously he gave so much to this franchise. It gave so much to the sport. We said for sure. So he got everything done, and he called me up, and he said, Coach, I'm leaving today to go back to San Diego. Can I come by and visit you? I said, yeah, sure. Love to see you. And Victor wasn't a man of many words, by the way. So Victor came over to my house and he had a box and he puts the box down on the counter. And I'm thinking he's going to stay for an hour or we'll a cup of coffee. We'll chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, after Pleasant ter ter Terry's, he said, OK, I got to go. And I go, well, let me see what's in the box. And he said, no, don't open it up until I leave. And I'm like, oh, OK. So he leaves. We gave each other a hug and I Love the guy and tremendous amount of respect. And I opened the box. Now, I believe he is the only goalkeeper in the history of indoor soccer to be the MVP of his team, to be the MVP of the All Star game, and to be the MVP of the league all in one year. 
And when I open the box, I'm pulling these out of the box, his three trophies. And in that letter, and I don't want to be, it's, it was special and confidential, but basically said, coach, we together did these three. Wow. I want you to have them. That's awesome. Wow. So someday soon, I'm going to be hopping on my plane or a plane, I should say, to San Diego. And I'm going to give them back to where they're supposed to be. So that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, you had them in a good pl- in a good place for them. And I didn't know you had your own plane. World of Futsal must be taking off much more than we thought. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that one. Yeah, we're al- we're almost there, Adam. I think. We're yeah, right, there. right. You only have uh, what's two hundred fifty thousand minus one hundred and thirty subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. Well, well, but, but, but Bud Seedley lives about two miles that way. I think he had his own jet. But there you go. Yep. Um. So you mentioned a couple times the uh, the men's national football foot not football futsal league. Oh. Uh, I I know yeah. there's a lot of political things going on in the indo- in the world of indoor soccer, and there have been for decades. But how can we like unite this sport? So you have, and I don't really want to get into either of these, but you have like the NISL starting with their four-team league. You got the ASL starting as a vaporware league. Um, you have a number of MASL players that have gone to play in the um, the CONCACAF futsal qualifying. And the U.S. team, I think now, are in, is it in Costa Rica for the for the World Cup? Lithuania. Lithuania. No, Lithuania. Almost, yeah. almost yeah. the right side of the world. So like September, September 12th. Yeah, so... And then, like, uh, there was just an exhibition with, with the what was what was de- touted the U.S. indoor national team playing the Mexican national team, and yet none of the teams, the MASL or the or the MSL itself, has like even acknowledged many of these things. Maybe a post here, a post there, but is there any way we can unite this whole thing to make it maybe not, even not MASL sponsored, but you know we support our players, we support this. And I kind of see the smirk on your face because I know I, I know. We know a lot of inside kind of info on this, but uh, there's maybe a certain couple of people involved that maybe the MSL doesn't want to be involved in, but uh, without getting that's, into those details, what do you think on that? That's not a smirk. That was a smile. Oh. Because, <laughs> Correct. Because, because, Correct. Because, because, because there is stuff coming out that we've already been working on. It's already written up. We got Josh Wilkins and Shane Butler and, and, and Josh is actually going to be working the court as a referee at the World Cup. Shane is one of only seven people in the world who sits on an expert uh, panel for FIFA. Um, we've had other referees that have been part of FIFA and world championships. And, and we have to um, celebrate that. And, and I think that's a story around the world. And, and speaking of referees, if you as a young person – 12, 13, 14, 15, want a referee indoor soccer. You want a referee futsal because your aspiration is to be a great outdoor referee. That's the pathway because you got to react quicker and you got to think quicker. Also the same thing if you want to be a great player. You could go through indoor soccer. You could go through futsal. And that's a, that's something that I got to say that futsal has done pretty good in the past five to ten years is they've tied themselves together to development with the outdoor. It seems as if outdoor and futsal talk over here and indoor soccer is over here. So one of our thing is we got to get back into the conversation. So many, Zoran Savic, okay, take for instance, assistant coach in Sporting KC, longtime player in the MISL. He said, I wish all my players would play one year in indoor soccer to learn how to defend by themselves. There are so many people in outdoor soccer that think that indoor soccer can really help the development. But what we need to do is we're not in the pool of the conversation. That's one reason why we thought it was important to talk to U.S. soccer. That's one of the reasons why we thought it'd be good to go to Kansas City and make a presence at the coaches' convention. And we got big news that will be coming up, coming out of that. So it should be indoor soccer. It should be futsal. It should be outdoor soccer. Look at the Milwaukee Wave. They've done a great job, right? They they started the the, the, the uh, SC Wave. Uh, they they just hired uh, Daniel Matos, who's actually on his way to Lithuania, a futsal program. And I think you're going to see this all over. One of the things, Adam, Gio, Matt, and to the listeners, 
is we firmly believe that each team should be developing its own players from a young age all the way up, and I'm talking boys and girls, so that they're fighting over the same 15 to 20 players every season. Every outdoor club in the world, every futsal club in the world develops its own players. You know why? Not only do you develop your players that are from your region, like the old St. Louis Steamers, but it's also a moneymaker because let's say you have a team, you have a player in one of our cities and he becomes a great player for, for that indoor team. And then maybe some outdoor team wants to buy him for a million dollars. I mean, that's a big part of this program. Or maybe you develop 10 of your own players through your own program to play for your own team. That's what happens around the world. That's what needs to happen in indoor soccer. So, so do you, do you think going off of that? Do you think the MASL should bring maybe back the draft? <laughs> this is not a smirk. This is a smile. <laughs> you guys are right on top of it. We we love the college draft for so many reasons. First of all, Kevin Healy he was one of the best guys in the college draft. Uh, he really did his due diligence, especially that first pick. You know that territorial pick. You know, when, when you pick that guy from, from Canton, uh, okay, uh, or Townsend State, and, and, and they go on, Barry, uh, help me, Gio, Barry. Um, oh, um, dude, you got me. Uh, Barry. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. There, there, there were so many great players from Baltimore that went on. So, yes, we do want to bring the college prep. When you go to the coaches' convention, you know as the draft there? Major League Soccer. Right. Every coach, college coach, high school coach, uh, European clubs, everyone's there. But we weren't there. So we're going to be there. So we're, we're but yes, the college, that college draft not only is great for our teams. It's also great for the media and mm-hmm. it's great for people to to follow the number one draft pick or maybe even have to trade a number one draft pick in order to get something going into the playoffs. There are so many different things. Uh I wish I could tell you about all the changes that that are on the table that's going to be coming up um, that I think is really going to be exciting. Adam, I'll let them uh, take credit for the uh, the draft. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the questions I had was I so I when I when I think about interviews and, and shows that we're having, I just kind of write down my thoughts throughout the day. So I'll be you know working from home and oh look, there's a thought. Let's grab it, write it down. I, uh, one thing I wrote down was, does indoor soccer have to be a target for MLS players at the end of their careers? How does the sport get positioned to be a target for players for their entire careers? I think that just kind of, it's obviously not something that you could fix in a year or two, or maybe even 10, maybe a, you know, a generational thing that may need to, to change the entire culture of it. But uh, it, Wait, you, there's like 1500 indoor centers across the United States. The sport's been around since 1978. If there was coaching education in indoor soccer, methodology, terminology, and we should have been developing players in the youth level for the last 40 years. And, and what is a diagonal run? What does man-to-man and zone mean? It, it, it's like we, we take all our players from outdoor. We take our players from indoor. Isn't it time we – and we got some great coaches, by the way. Every player that plays indoor can become a great teacher of youth players to then move on into the indoor. That is such a huge market now that I am firm, firmly believe, and Shep and JP does also, is that we really mm-hmm. got to get our coaches. We got to get our members. We got to get everybody involved and say, let's go teach this sport to the masses how to play indoor correctly that you can be a better outdoor player or you can be a better futsal player. I mean, why not grab it all and bring it and hug it? That's what we think. I, I, com- I, completely, that you? <laughs> I completely agree. I've been saying that each club should have a youth academy, not just to develop players, but also to develop the next coach or to, to help expose the, the club or the game to more people. You know, it's, 
it's one thing to take a outdoor player to come in. It, that transition takes longer. Can you imagine how much time you would save if you develop them from youth level? And not just that, it's a brand loyalty that they're spreading to their friends or their families and stuff like that. It's yeah. it's such a huge market that I sometimes sit there and think like, why are we taking advantage of it? <laughs> it's it's but like instant it's attendance. In, in, the old, in the old days, we said it for the most part, it took three years for a player to really learn the game. You, you had your Stankoviches and you had your mm-hmm. Julie Bees. And in modern day, you got your Frank Towers and your Greg Childs and your Greg Howes. Howes, he came. That guy could play soccer, futsal, indoor, outdoor, beach. He, he could play anywhere. But in the old days, if you played three years, you played 120 games. Now mm-hmm. it takes you six years to get to almost 120 games. And, and speaking of coaches, and we have some great coaches, where do you go to learn how to be an indoor soccer coach? Exactly. There's, no, there's no books on it. At the coaches' convention, there's nothing on it. You learn through either your coach that he's trying to learn it or it's th- through osmosis. And that's one of the things that Shep, JP, and I said. It's like I've coached in a lot of games. i played in a lot of games. We really think that we can really help the next generation of coaches who then are going to help the next generation of players. And, and when you do that, you build a fan base. I mean, you know, you, you go to back to Christian Pulisic. Christian grew up in an indoor futsal family, right? His dad was in Harrisburg Heat. Mm-hmm. His dad goes to the Detroit Ignition. And on that team, you got Rick Ardino, you got Everton, and a couple other guys. And what's he doing every day? He's playing indoor soccer and futsal. By the way, where's he playing right now? Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, he, yeah, he's like a poster boy for 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 the league. Uh, so yes, do, do we need players like Landon Donovan to come because Landon was great and Jermaine? But I think we can grab young players who have so much ability. And by the way, there's so many great Hispanic and Latino. And, and kids in the inner city that just need one opportunity and you will see so many great players come out. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. I'd like to see a time where Adrian Perez could actually have a real decision on, should I go to Ontario Fury? Should I stay here? Or should I go to LAFC and not have it be just not even a decision? Um, that would yeah. be, ni- that would be nice to see. Yeah, because so, uh, I'm pretty sure his career would have went different. You know, like he's having a tough time in D.C. now. It's right, like, right. He played yeah. a handful of games as a sub in LAFC, but there's just the the level is just it, just different. Um, well, you been, know, that, that, that kind of wraps back to the point where we were talking about, right, like, and how important marketing is. Because MASL, or sorry, MLS wasn't where it is now without the branding they've done. So... That's why when teams don't take advantage of either social media or their marketing teams or any avenue, right, for for their exposure, it just, like, I love what some of these teams do because they do a great job. Like, KC is one of them. Uh, Dallas is one of them. There's, there's a few teams that do it so well. It would just be great if we can get every team on board because it would really help the game. I think so, at least. You know, we've had we talked about coaches, we've talked about players, we talked about fans, we talked about the referees. We haven't talked about owners, right? Members. That's the most important thing. Yeah. You know, MLS was really by three guys. It was Anschutz, Kraft, and Hunt. They owned ten teams together. Anschutz mm-hmm. had six of them, and they spent a lot of money to keep it going. I mean, there was a time where they were just going to drop it, and then they started taking off. But then they had to drop back a couple more teams to catapult to almost 30 teams right now. When you have owners that believe and you have owners that have the money to stay for the long haul and do things correctly. And we have a great group of owners. I mean, it's been great to work with all of them. It really starts at the top. And and what one thing that we wanted to do was wanted to relieve the owner's a little bit to say you can focus on your on your team your club 
You can focus on your core businesses. And then obviously we work for them, but let us run the league so that you can focus on what you need to focus on. And we work together to move forward. And that's what we're trying to do. That's awesome. Well, I have a, I have a question ears. from, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, I just said it's music to my ears. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, so I have, a con- I have a controversial question. Your friend, uh, Scotty Fellows, um, former uh, scoreboard um, guy who ran the scoreboard from Lockie Wave, he actually moved sure. to Dallas about a month ago. I will not be doing that going forward, but uh, he did a great job. Actually, he was he great was amazing. Family. He he was great family. <clears throat> yeah, his kids are. I, I told him let the kid loose in the in the scoreboard area just for five minutes one game, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he so this is a very very pointed question. I think everyone everyone here knows exactly what we're talking about and why. Um, let's see if I can read his word for word or if i should uh, paraphrase what super should, wide program i'm gonna par- to- i'm gonna paraphrase it so uh he's looking to wonder if you if if the league is going to implement both minimum and maximum player salaries salary cap or like a percentage of what the league worth is towards salaries because i think we've run into a few situations over the past few years where teams are just trying to buy as many players as they can and i think we're as fans were and, and we've heard from other owners that they're concerned that those types of moves could ruin the player economy. Yeah. Uh, parody obviously is very important in all sports. Uh, one thing that we did do to help it, 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 to answer the question quickly, we it, it's a lot of legal things depending on what your business structure is for, for instance, major league soccer is a single entity. So Mm -hmm. the players don't sign for the club. They sign for the league. So legally they can do some other things. Uh, uh, And and our member group here is also signed differently. So there's things that you got to make sure that that you watch. But parity is is really important. One thing that we did is that there was this free agent window that opened up for two or three weeks, well before a guy was even a free agent. I guess some fans liked it or whatever, but it didn't make sense because it drove up salaries. So let's say, for instance, I developed Matt and from a young age, and now he's playing for me. And I sign him to a three- or four-year contract because I believe in him. But then all of a sudden, before the end of his contract, where I, a team should never let a player get into the last year of his contract, ever, unless you don't want him. Yeah. For, for a team to have a player's contract end and then you got to negotiate, that's not good business sense. So if I have Matt, I'd go to Matt and say, Matt, okay, you got one year left in your contract. Do you want to make some more money? Uh, and a lot of us live paycheck to paycheck. And he says, sure, I love it here. I'm going to give you a raise. We're going to add a couple more years to it. So we build. That's what we did with the Wave. And, and you know, and that's what Baltimore did. And, mm-hmm. and when you keep a core of players together, you you become successful. Um, we, we are looking at everything we possibly can to protect every member and every player. There's nothing more than we would want as a league is to give more money to more players in order to take care of their families. Um, We need to protect our members so that the New York Yankees can't buy every player or get every player. That takes time. That takes changing a culture, but Mm -hmm. most importantly, changing a system. But these are a lot of the things that we have sat down and, and, and talked about it. And remember I said 30 minutes ago, it seems as if a lot of people are fighting over the same 20 players. I've said, go find your players, develop your players. And in the long run, you'll have a great team because you'll keep your core players, not taking one from there and one from there and one from there. And and it doesn't work that way. The best teams in the world have great cores of players. They have a culture and they have a system. So Scotty, we are working on that also. Go ahead, Matt. When, when do I sign that contract, Keith? I'm, I'm right. <laughs> I'm good. Let's I'll do it. 
<laughs> so don't get his hopes up. <laughs> I want to I want to talk real quick to St. Louis fans. So St. Uh, uh, St. Louis Ambush have announced five or six signings, and what they are is their extensions on contracts. And if you listen to what Keith just said, they're they're retaining guys, but they're extending their contracts. And the St. Louis fans are kind of complacent because they say, "Well, this doesn't really help us because it's just the same guys," but it shows that the team is making a commitment to those players and they want those players to stay. And your, your comment about never letting a player get into the end of their, the last year of their contract is really interesting because it, it's, yeah, go on. Sorry. But you know, it, it ties in with the visa thing too, because what you get is you get a guy who goes into their last year of their, of their contract, their visa's running out. Um, I'm going to, let's talk about Josh Lemos. Might as well, you know, say who I'm talking about. Um, and then all of a sudden, June rolls around and he has to move back to Canada. And now he's stuck in this weird COVID state where he's signed a new contract, but it was too late because the visa wasn't extended. And now he's stuck. So he can't come back unless the visa's here. Um, visas aren't getting renewed. You know, it's just a. I feel if that, pro- like you said, if that process were done the year before his contract ended, all was said and done. So we can go into the last year of his contract and not even worry about it because it's not. It's no longer the last year. It's extended by three, four, five years or whatever it is. Well, COVID sure put a big anchor into the pool. So, you know, we we, we got to be honest about this. It, it's kind of like when we used to have coaches meetings, the, the rules committee, we'd be down in Florida where we're at, and there'd be 10 of us coaches in a room passionately, and it would take 18 hours to talk about one rule change. Wow. So then we would then we would vote passionately, and then the next day we'd call the head of the referees and we'd tell, hey, by the way, you made the rule change. And then the head of referees would say, hey, by the way, you didn't think about this, 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 <laughs> this, 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 this. And we're like, oh my God, that much impact. So we decided two things. <laughs> One, gotta have the head, gotta have the head of the referee on that committee. And two, you can't vote on the same day. You gotta go to sleep on it. Oh, sure. Think about it and come back the next day. This is another this is another thing that it looks like it's a black and white situation, but there are so many different layers of what's going on. And I know for the average fan and, and for people that love the game, it seems like, oh my gosh, it's as simple as one, two, three. But I'm telling you, it's not simple as one, two, three, but we're trying to take care of one through ten. So uh with the salaries, with the uh visa issues. Uh, with parity, uh, with free agency. Uh, and, and I've recommended, we've recommended, if you have a player that you want, don't ever let them get into the last year of the contract. Take care of that player. And that that's 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 huge. It seems so easy yeah. when you say it like that, though. It's just so, <laughs> like, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you keep your players because – yeah, there's, we hear from players all the time that uh, we'll get reached out to saying, you guys have all these great ideas, but when it comes down to it, you got guys making 75 bucks a game, you guys other guys making 100 grand a year. How do you, how is that working together? And how do you, and, and there, were, there were a lot of bad feelings when, when Landon Donovan came in. Um, I think, oh, you know, across the league, because they announced exactly what he was making and this and that. And other players were like, well, that's more than our entire payroll. And yeah, you know, it's just I like the idea of parity, um, but we understand that it won't. It, it can't. Yeah, you know, it. that's another thing. The yeah. New York, the New York Cosmos brought Pele, and 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 Pele made a lot more money than everybody else, and it catapulted the New York Cosmos as well as the NASL. So Landon Donovan to come in, did he make more money? Sure, but he, he's Landon Donovan, and I believe they actually made money through that process oh. of selling jerseys and selling tickets and, and, and doing all that. Absolutely. You, you can't, you, 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 you can't treat everybody the same, but treat everybody fair. Right. Right. So again, I think this is a process that we're all looking at is obviously we want to take care of the players. From I personally, I personally think it's also like a, a culture thing. Like he's been saying, right? Like I, I me personally, as one, I was like a really big fan of the game, and two, just this platform that us three guys have. 
like I can feel culture change. Obviously, that doesn't happen overnight. So it's like, you know, there's certain things that teams may or may not have done in the past because that wasn't, you know, what their whether their culture was or their practices were. But now with the shift in the leadership and maybe certain changes within the league itself, we'll see that culture spread out into those teams, right? And we might see those teams behave differently. It just, it just. I think we all need to take a few minutes to just, hey, let's see what happens. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Thanks, Gio. Don't don't <laughs> give us don't give us three days. Don't give <laughs> us three months. You know, rate us after three years. You know, uh, that's another thing we didn't talk about is the players are so important on the field, but you know what? The team in the front office exactly is extremely important. But you can't have a great team and only have a certain amount of people in a front office trying to sell it. I mean, there, there's so many things that we're trying to wrap our, our hands around and, and, and learn and teach and cultivate. So, again, it, it change is not going to come overnight. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. In anything, you can't, you can't change a culture in a week, a year, a month, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's so important. You know, I do motivational talks for, for, for companies and I always talk about, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals and no disrespect, but they, they haven't won many Super Bowls. They haven't won many playoff games. And, and you might have a wide receiver, wide open, 30 yards from the end zone, no wind, no snow, no nothing. And he drops the ball and he drops the ball. But then all of a sudden he gets traded to the New England Patriots. And now it's 35 mile an hour wind and a lot of snow. And he's making a one iron catch with people around him. Is it because of the Jersey? Is it because of the culture? Is it because of the system? And, and I, I believe it is. And, and you see teams that have struggled over the years, change their culture, change their system. Just go back to Greg Muir. Greg, Greg is looking at this thing saying, I don't know a lot of these players. I've watched them. I'm going to sign a good core of players. I know he's going to find other players. And he's going to give them a, a, a period of time to prove themselves. I took over L.A. Lasers when I was 26 years old. And and I got everybody in the room. And I said, look at etch a sketch. I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to give everybody 30 days. No matter what you did, good or bad in the past, at the end of 30, we're going to start making decisions. And at the end of the 30 days, I had to start making some hard decisions. Uh, we won 17 games that first half of the year and then went on and won over 30 games the second year. So, Give your coaches time. Give your players time. Give the members time. Give this culture shift time. And while you're doing it, stay positive. Yep. I like it. Uh, you guys yeah, have any other questions? We just hit the hour mark, so I think we should probably. Yep. But uh, uh, Matt has a very important question. What? Is What's he it, signing? It's <laughs> not the whole well, it's a question you asked everyone last year. Yeah. No. So I'll, I'll do the question I, I was talking to you about earlier. So I asked JP the same question. What game in, in, in your years of, of, of being a part of indoor soccer, do you remember most memorable game? Well, that's kind of saying, which of your children do you love mo most? And I've been blessed uh, to be in so many incredible games i mean like i said that first game in nassau coliseum pete rose was in my locker and then in the locker room i, I, I think i scored a goal that game against shep that was my hero i mean I, 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 joe macknick has got a, like a a notebook with the rules i mean they're written out in hand i mean that game comes to mind game five uh game four against cleveland if they would have wanted the convocation center they would have been the champions and we totally changed the way we played. We were a high-pressure team. We dropped back to the yellow line. We won that game. And that was on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock when it was over. And not one ticket was sold for the Bradley Center for Friday night. At the Indoor soccer is so great, you just can't tab one. It's a great way to answer it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I agree. I just didn't know if there was one specific one. <laughs> All right, Keith. I thank you very much for joining us. Can I say us. one last point? Thank you so much. Uh, we, we Can I say one last yeah. thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Holy, go nuts. This would not be all possible from 1978 to 2021 
if it wasn't, and and this comes from Chef JP and myself, John, Rob, everybody at the league office, this would not have been possible at all for us to live our dreams, to bring young men and women from around the world to play this great game if it wasn't for the fans. And, and we have met so many wonderful fans, and I'm looking forward to getting back into arenas and visiting everybody and talking to people. So on behalf of all our members, okay, the owners, on behalf of everyone involved in the league, we just want to give a big thank you to all the great fans of, of indoor soccer, and please stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you on a field very soon. Can't wow. wait. Thank you. Can't wait. Thank you so much. All right, Keith, thank, have a good night. Thank Thanks you for a lot. Us. Okay, guys. Take a quick time. I'll be right back. are back just the wow three that's all I, that's all i have to say really i mean uh thank you for the msl to to give us access to i mean jp keith tozer who i have been wanting to to talk to for years now um that was awesome and i think from the three of us like that's music to our ears what he was saying absolutely yeah, yeah I'm, so i met keith about a decade ago but it was before I was in any Facebook groups or in you know owned any jerseys or you know did this. We we it was right before we got our season tickets uh, for the wave, and, and I kind of just it was after one of the games. We were kind of walking around, just took his hand, said hi, and I don't even know if I introduced myself or not. But he wouldn't. He, there's no way he would know me. So I'm looking forward to him being in. You know, he's obviously here in Milwaukee because uh, where else would he be? And uh, just to see him at a game and and say hi in person. So that was yeah. that was great. I'm, I'm I'm excited to see what kind of shape the league takes because, um, you know, Josh did a lot of things, and there's some things he couldn't do, but I I think the league as a whole is ready for that next phase, and I think this is a good phase to yeah. you know. I think, a good... I think he had a little bit too much on his plate, yeah. and he didn't have a lot of experience in the indoor soccer league i mean the the three guys that we have in front of us who are running this whole thing have i mean like we said so many accolades i mean jp della cameras so called numerous games us three right you're talking about a ton of games and and, and keith obviously I mean, doing pretty much everything um those are three huge names in the sport yeah 100 percent so I, I think I think the league going forward is it's up from here. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I want to emphasize what he said, and and I'm very guilty of this myself. Um, patience. We need patience. There, are, there. While there are some things that I feel could be going on right now and should be going on right now, I think overall um, there's a lot of you know a lot of fans I've been seeing. We're already impatient that nothing has happened yet. 
According yeah, to there's you. no no announcement of players or schedule or. Uh, yeah, you would think with the new ownership coming in that we would have a new schedule by now. Well, what? Um, so there are a couple of the questions I wanted to ask him that I felt probably was a little early to ask him about. I, w- I wanted to make sure I got the visa players in. Um, the primary focus, he said exactly what JP said, that they're looking to do, they're not looking to go on one thing and go, we need to build this. They're looking at doing everything. And they both use that 25% number as their, as their kind of target goal. So we know that's written down somewhere and that's their target that they're aiming for. Um, sorry, Scotty, I wasn't going to ask about MPS scoring. Um, sorry, ah, Steve Squires. We, we actually chatted about the Lemos rule right before we went live. And Keith said he wasn't involved in that at all. <laughs> And he had no say in changing that rule. But he did have a goalkeeper rule, and I think we should probably just wait until that comes out. Um, I wanted to... Yeah, a lot of things... There, there was a lot of things that he couldn't say in, in regards to changes uh, for the league. Um, just be on the lookout and, and be patient. Um, I did want to ask... So his comment about free agency I thought was really interesting. I thought that two week free agent like uh was it was just the free period that they called it that was at the end of the season was really interesting and really kind of fun to watch things happen. But then for so many years in a row until Florida did their thing, there were no movement. His comment about that saying that's bad for the league and that's bad for players because teams should make sure I, I think that's gonna be part of the culture change. Is if teams want to keep players it shouldn't be the players bowing down to the teams. It should be the teams working with the players and saying, hey, your three-year contract is coming up. We're coming on your last season of the contract. Let's do something about it right now. Yeah. And, and I, you, look at, you look at teams that have, like, quote-unquote dynasties, and, and I, hate to, I hate to say this. I mean, Milwaukee, Baltimore, not, not Utica yet. But um, I, I think those teams, they have, like, a huge oh god okay what what sound are we doing i did the price is right song (laughs) yeah so i think both of those teams i i mean had core players and and they kept they kept those core players for for years and that's and that's how you win championships i think I, i don't think it's spending the money to get player a player from each team and and have them so, so that's what I was gonna say. I think, I think the whole, and I don't want to like take too much time on this, but like, I think the whole free agency period was M- MASL's way to try to be European, and that's not what this league is, you know. So, why take on something that isn't what's been here, you know, or what's what? Not, not to be like, oh, the '80s was better or anything, but in in some things, like we need to keep the essence of the game without trying to change too, too, too much. Right. Because then that's when we get away from what we enjoy. Well, what turned out and this goes back to like the parody and the salaries and things like that. If you have a list of, you know, like, like Sydney used to do the list of the top 40 free agents and there were players on there who would never move. And there were teams that would never pick up any of those 40 players because they don't, they're just like, how do you have a, I got it. I don't, want, I don't want to pick on this team. How do you have a Turlock try to sign Frank Tayu, for example? Yeah. As much as I love Turlock, and no, no offense to the Turlock fans, because I know you guys are passionate and crazy, and I love you guys for it. But there's just there's certain teams that just there were never like El Paso was never going to pay to bring in a big name. They had a couple of big names who immediately left. When the, when the chance happened, I think, you know, if you get a team that's spending more than they're bringing in on player salaries, we've talked about this kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you know, with, with, with Sydney's top 40, I mean, most of those, if you looked at like the percentage of the player moving, I would say 38, 37, 38 of those are like less than 50%. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then you get the ones that are shocking, but it's like, to, to Keith's point, there should be very little shocking news in player transfers. Um, 
unless you get a player who really, really wants to leave for whatever reason, Max Ferdinand, for example. There shouldn't I'd be... Like, I'd like to see, so back back in the, the 90s, uh, yeah. you would, would notice they would have, like, trades. Like, oh, well, the Cleveland Crunch traded X, Y, and Z to the Milwaukee Way for X and Y. Like, I kind of like that, but you don't see that. I mean, you see, like, oh, this person got traded to St. Louis for cash considerations, like, Future, we're waiting. Milwaukee Wave is eagerly waiting future considerations from the St. Louis ambush for Jonathan Santos. It does. What does that even mean? And and I mean, I get you know, per the they always have that disclaimer per the league rules, terms are not discussed. Um, I know some of the moves are player for player, I know they're one player for two players, I know there's players in some cash thrown in. We don't need to know the like the details of that. Um, it looks like the if, if they bring back the draft, I mean, that would be kind of cool. Like, oh, player A gets traded to Ontario for player B and a, a second round pick in the draft or something. Yeah. Like that. that that requires more than a culture shift. That requires some time in there because yeah. you can't you can't change the culture of of. And I, I Jack brought in a a comment about um, homegrown talent, which yeah. I think is oh, Scotty made a comment. I got a comment. Second, which I think is is a good thing, but there needs to be a balance of of local talent that's grown and international flair because international 100%. flair is exactly what it what it 100%. sounds like. There are so much cool. There's so many cool things that happen when a fan and an international player connect on 100%. a fan game personal level. It's just it, you know, yeah. What are you pointing at? Uh, the, the team right there. Oh, this one? Oh, no, sorry, U- this one? Utica, Utica, I mean, if you look at what Syracuse had, I mean, they no. had a lot. They had a, no, no, none of those. None of those. This it's one was per- almost on the back of a whole Brazilian squad. No, it, no, I was pointing at the Utica logo. Anyways, oh. so if you look. Syracuse, what they had, they had a lot of local talent. I mean, you had Ben Raymond, Nate Bordeaux, uh, Andrew. What? The disrespect. <laughs> oh, did you get rid of the logo? That's not fair. Maybe. Right. <laughs> That's not nice. But you have a lot of those local players that have gelled together over the years. And now, now they're over in Utica. And you've added the likes of Christian Segura and Moises Gonzalez. So, I mean, you guys talk about that, and I hyped up your teams a little bit, but now I'm going to hype up mine. Um, I think that's a perfect combination of local talent and international flair. I'm done. Yeah, I, but but the thing is, you I mean, you talk about Utica. It's also in Baltimore. It's also Milwaukee. It's also in St. Louis. It's also in Kansas. I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's in um, Dallas too. I would say it's. Yeah, but I'm I'm talking just Utica, big things. Sorry. I I would say it. Wait, 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 wait. Did, did you just bring up Dallas? Oh, boy. Well, it's the only team in Texas right now. And um, they won more championships than Utica. <laughs> I believe Matt needs a timeout here. <laughs> um, one, of the que- one of the questions I was going to ask was, was the, uh, are the remaining 13 teams set, or can we expect more changes? And I didn't think that was a fair question to ask, because that – I think it, that's too early to ask. It's too early, and it puts him in a position of being. If he knows anything, it puts him in a position that he has to lie to us. Yeah. So I, I didn't ask that. I didn't. I, Good call. Didn't think that was that was fair. Rule changes. I felt we could have a separate two hour call. You know, talk all about rule changes that were proposed. <laughs> I think because, that's an off a offline talk. <laughs> right. I know he is, is passionate about is, the goalkeeper. Uh, or dogs. What? What happened? I, I did not ask about oh, corn dogs. We did not, Matt. But that's fine. Hey, uh, by the way, I want to address something that you guys may have noticed. Uh, this whole coordination, jersey coordination thing was not planned. <laughs> this was a weird fluke. Like, I was, I figured Keith Tozer would wear a wave shirt, but I was a little cold earlier today. I wanted something with long sleeves on. I don't have a wave shirt with long sleeves on it. So I was like, oh, I got my my special granatella 
Number 18. Oh, that's the one I have on. <laughs> you don't have, you have Granatella? No, yeah. well, my la- <laughs> with my last name, obviously. Yeah. So I, so I was like, oh, wear this. And then Matt and I were chatting right before we went live. He's like, do you have your, your all-star jersey? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I was, oh, okay. And he grabs this. And then Geo shows up, bam, in the all-star jersey already. So absolutely 100% not planned. Um, not planned. But totally worth it. But totally worth it. Scotty said two things. So our uh, future considerations are Jonathan Pachar from St. Louis, who wasn't even on St. Louis that we got on the wave that never was announced, but he's on the roster on the MASL site. So go figure. And then Scotty had a comment that I actually was going to ask. And it, it just didn't, I didn't get the right time. Uh, He said trades can still happen, but players can block it. So I think that's an issue in our league is that a player, any player can block any trade for any reason. Um, and it's... But isn't that right, though? Isn't that, like, I mean, if a player is happy, so why that, force them to move? So this is where the culture and the parody and the whole thing come in. If, um, if this were a full-time job, like it is with, say, NFL players, um, there was this old commercial and I can't even remember who the player was. I can't even remember who the product was, but the, the whole joke throughout the thing was that this guy kept getting traded. The coach would come to him, yeah, hey, Johnson, you're traded to Detroit. And you know, on the next scene, oh, Johnson, you're traded to Miami, you know, whatever. In the NFL, you can do that because there's salary caps, there's minimums, there's, you know, they're going to pay for you. They're not going to you know, have you go, okay, well, we're trading you to this other city and you have to figure out how to get there and where to live for three months. And then you're just going to go back home. I think if we had that in this league, it would be a little different. Um, but players, not only can they refuse a trade, they can sit. They can just go, you know what? I don't get that much money playing MASL that if you want to trade me to this team I definitely don't want to play on, I'll just sit and I won't play. And we've seen that happen over the couple over the years. That's true. And I think they're – I don't know what the solution is, but I think that whole thing needs to be addressed somehow. Oh, yeah. I agree. I agree to that. And then, yeah, so the other thing I was going to ask was free agency. But when he, he made that comment, it's like, oh, because the rumor, there was rumors going around. I mean, this was, I think this was before the big three even came on, that free agency would be September 1st because that's when a lot of the contracts end. I wanted yeah, to see. Yeah, a lot of them end, I mean, today. Right. So I wanted to see if, if he wanted to maybe tease something, but then he made the comment about free agents. I'm like, you know, let that go. Um, there was a question about... Scotty had a question about... Um, youth programs? Youth programs, and uh, he sent me he sent something to me privately about uh, like merchandise and jersey deals and things. I think oh. that would be a better question for Shep, who's going to be handling sponsorships and things. So I told him we'd hold off on that until we had Shep on. The next, the next big three, the last of the big three, we're hoping to have Shep on here. Um, haven't scheduled anything, and uh, we'll start to do that over the next couple of weeks or whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to ask him, and maybe I guess I, I, since we don't have an answer from him because I forgot to ask, <laughs> I'll throw it into a hypothetical for you guys. What would be if we would see any ex- exhibition matches leading up to the the, the, the season, right? <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to get I, I wanted to get more into the whole. So, for those of you who don't know, the U.S. played Mexico the other night in Boise, Idaho, mm-hmm. using all, the, almost the entire um, positive US team. Adam. What I know, I know the almost the entire San Diego team was or San Diego almost the entire U.S. team was San Diego, Ontario, and Drew Ruggles, and um, well Nelson played for San Diego last season, so I guess that counts. The turf was interesting. Oh, he did. I forgot. Yeah, I yeah. totally yeah. forgot that. Um, but there was no mention anywhere from any of the teams or the MSL about the game at all. I think you and I were like. There's an exhibition game going on. No, I, the reason I knew about it was because, and I, I swear, I was like, oh, these guys know about it, um, was because a lot of the, the Mexican players and teams were posting about it. I Maybe I was out of touch because I don't, I don't follow. I, I follow all the Mexican teams, but I guess I'm not following the no. players. Um, so Savage made a post about them, and 
Somebody else did. I can't remember. So but, you know, he knew about it, but didn't want to tell us. I mean, that's fine. yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, we see. I, I just we, it didn't bring, we bring you back, and, and then you just uh, withhold information. I mean, that's fine. Makes sense for me because it was like, you know, that that organization and the MASL haven't built that bridge. So one yeah, of the, yeah, one of the things I keep talking about it for you know every year, every week, every show. Uh, we went down to St. Louis in I don't know five years ago, maybe for the um, it was the owners' meeting weekend, and then they had the MASL International Challenge where they had the U.S. versus the world. Now the U.S. team was very very heavy on St. Louis players. The world team was very heavy on Wave players. So we made it a little trip. We drove down there. We stayed in the same hotel. Um, got to talk to some of the players. That's where I met the old owner from, former owner from uh, Solus to Sonora, who got me in my jersey and, and you know, met players and things. It was just kind of a cool experience. And then there were a number of MASL exhibition games, like when Mississauga was coming in. Brad, you're in being that, naughty. In that arena and things like that. Uh, that field looked good, yeah. Um, but I, from what I'm heard, from what I'm hearing, the person who runs the American Association of Five Six Seven, which is one of the more ridiculous names I've heard, is the it's former US Soccer Five Six Seven. What? No, it's American Association of Soccer. Is it? Yeah, I know. Is the former former commissioner of the MASL? And there's bad blood between the current league. And this person, and that's why well, we don't know what the new leadership, right? We don't, we don't. But there's bad blood between the owners. Well, this is true. This is true. Um, so let's move on from a different topic. Oh, so I want to, I want to actually answer Geo's question. Okay. Will Will we see exhibition games? And you kind of said this. Well, no, no, no. My question was, my question was going to be, if there were, who would you want to see? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback off what you said on Twitter. So for those of you that don't follow Gio, well, first of all, follow him. Um, he wants to be I appreciate Baltimore, that. <laughs> Baltimore versus the Cleveland Crunch. I kind of want to see Utica City versus Cleveland as well. I think that would be a cool exhibition game. Maybe have Cleveland go around the, the, the Northeast and, and do exhibition games. I think, I think that would be a great, a great idea. That's what I'm saying. Yes. No. No. As a oh, rite of passage to join the MASL, no. a team Matt has to no. play the defending champion in an exhibition match. Oh, so San Diego and, and Cleveland? San Diego? No, no, the defending champions. At San the Diego? The <laughs> Ron Newman Cup is in San Diego, from what yeah, I Yeah, I know. I know. Yes, yeah, San Diego. Yes, fine. Okay. You get it. Um. <laughs> I'm actually, sorry. actually, no, because <laughs> Cleveland isn't joining this season. So it would be the champions that coming up from this coming up season. <laughs> Scotty's wild. He said he wants to see Dallas and Milwaukee. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because Milwaukee's completely different now. Oh, because it's in no, because he lives in Dallas and he needs a team to oh, root for. This is true. Dallas doesn't have one. Boy, uh, come on, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. No, so, but, hey, but, <clears throat> completely different topic. No, don't change it. This is a good topic. I wanted to say mine. All right. Besides Baltimore and Cleveland, obviously, I would like to see Savage and KC. I would like to see Savage against anybody before they join the league. That would be cool. Even if it's a Mexico, Mexico, you know, Savage Flash showdown. That'd be a good one, too. That would be cool to see because uh, I don't think many people know who the Savage are. Um, or how good they are. Or how good I, they are, right. I think in general needs more exhibition games. Like, we only hear about, like, yeah, that's true. one one or two of them. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do enjoy the inter intra squad games that, um, well, Utica put on a couple of years ago. But I also enjoyed uh, U.S. versus the Canadian All-Star team. Or something like that, but yeah. I think I think, in, I think bringing in other teams would would be would be nice. I think, yeah. think it would be fun, and like I, me, I'm not really big on the All Star stuff because like they don't have enough time to to listen. Hear hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. 
Just get rid of his uh, video, Adam. Hear me out. Hear me out. This All Star is fine because it's you know it's more an event, not necessarily a game. But like an exhibition is to prepare for the season, right? So you want to see like teams actually who are trying to build chemistry and not just for show, right? Yeah. But that's why I say that. What about a uh, like the U.S. Women's um... have two teams go up against each other, not the same team going up against each other. Yeah. When when the U.S. Women's team won the the World Cup, they did the the victory tour. Now it's now it's I think it's called She Believes Cup. Yeah. Well, no, that's a new that's a new thing because that doesn't necessarily follow when they win. Right. But no, you, but, but similar just, to that. It yeah. Was, it was born from that. We, I mean, there's a lot of things. The problem with that is there are so many players who do other things in the off season. This is true. And to get them back and to get conditioned in enough time to actually do something, uh, I we saw in December we saw the West team. Their workout was super intense. Remember that on on the uh, the day of the the game mat, the West team was out there just wow, and the East yeah. team was still almost like working on fundamentals and things. And you could yeah, tell. It, well, I mean, it really it really comes down to each coach, right? Because like for example, I like maybe I shouldn't say this. My coach might hate me after this, but like like they're starting preparations in September. So it's like September to when do we start? November. That's two months. Ours is uh, hopefully whenever the baseball season ends. What? So anyway, what did we just talk about? Um, you need to go to a Buddhist monk, <laughs> right? And learn patience. Yeah, I have patience. How long is that going to take? <laughs> So I want to make a, just a little quip here. Um, and I'm picking on you guys, but I'm doing it in a friendly way. And I'm, by you guys, I mean San Diego fans. You guys are quick oh. to always jump on the East versus West thing saying, well, the East, they only played in a seven-team league, so those championships didn't count. Okay, next topic. You've gone from worse to worse. <laughs> you got to go back up. It's sarcasm is an art form. This is true. <laughs> I know, but you were going to change the topic. I cut you off. Were you that gonna, was the topic I was going to change. It. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah, I was going to, I, I was, so I, I think that's all I was going to do to bring up with, uh, with Keith. Um, there was a, a, Don, I had a question of what are the top priorities you see, you see to deal with ASCP. And I think it's, as he answered in kind of uh, what was Steve's question about primary focus, those two are kind of related, and I think there is no one thing. And I think we, we as fans, you know, I, we've seen over the years, like the argument I had with the guy about, who he said, as soon as we make the goals smaller, there'll be more scoring and people come to the games more. And as soon as we get rid of the three-line rule, then people come to the games. And as soon as we get go back to MPS, then people are going to come to the games and, and things like that. Uh, you know so what's going to bring people to the game? People. Advertisement and branding. Right. But I think no, there's no multiple. one thing. There's no like one magic button that you can push. Oh yeah, of course not. And no, yeah. but I mean like 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 I'll be positive, so I'll just shut up. I, I just think I think I think more outreach versus like not, you know, these teams that are not active, it's doing themselves an injustice as opposed to teams. I guarantee We'll see Casey, St. Louis, and all them with more attendance than some of these teams that usually would have the higher attendance because of that. Yeah, I, I would agree, and I think, um, but but I think, I think it's only one small part. Because, oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And and let me say something quick, um, Mike Zimmerman, if you're watching this far or at all, I am one hundred percent with you. I'm one not against you at all. But I think there are a number of fans, and I'm picking up, I'll call it Wave fans here. But I'm one of them. But there's fans on a number of teams that I've heard of across the league who are disappointed in their team's lack of engagement, especially during COVID when it was, it was a free pass to get your fans engaged, to do your throwback Thursday and your Taco Tuesday night. Your, no, that's uh, the best one. Oh, Wallace score a Wednesday. 
There's a, oh, I just oh, invented that's that. A that's, good a good, that's a good one. I like that. Oh, can we make that ours and we just like do a clip of the wall of score? Absolutely. We did it. Copyright. Oh, um, but I mean, I think, I think we're granted. There's a lot of things going on. COVID was can't use COVID as a standard year. And I think what happens, we only remember what's happened to us most recently, which is no season season ending, you know, abruptly, then no season. And then now we're here in this waiting period. Um, but I think, uh, I think as part of the overall culture change of the league, that's something that's just going to be picked up along the way. Yeah. And, I don't think I anyone's have... actively fighting. No, we don't want to engage with our fans. I think it's just a matter no, of, of course not. we have a hundred no. things to do on our list and engaging with our fans is like 50th and we have time to do five. But well, I, think, I, think... I think, I do think teams need to bring someone on that can address that. Yeah. And that's, and that's exactly what I was about to say. I was, oh, and I beat you to the punch. Like, yeah. What? Nothing. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I've, I've thought of this for a while now. I think each team should have some sort of, like, fan liaison, if you will. So owner goes oh, to the fan. Oh, about this before. Yeah, so they go to the fan and say, hey, how can we improve our product? Or what what can we do better? Like, is the, the pregame show too short? Are, are, how are the replays? How, how's the overall environment? And I think Keith mentioned that in in the interview. He said there's going to be someone at each arena that's going to like go over all that, and and that's an awesome idea. I love it. So as, as much as I hate doing them and getting them, fan engage, them. fan engagement survey is the way to go because you can write a lot of questions. You can write pointed questions to make it favorable, but you can write <laughs> a lot of different uh, questions of is the music too loud or, and, and you don't even have to do a yes, no, you can do like on a scale of one to 10, how loud is the music in your arena where 10 being the loudest and one being the quietest. And you can, you can get things in a way that you can get meaningful data along, as long as you get enough samples. Um, you can do the whole thing online. There's sites that will do it for you. They can track users. They can make sure you only do it once. They, there's a lot yeah. of things you can get done. Uh, and I think that would be good both from the team and from the league level. Mm-hmm. Well, Utica, Utica did that the first year of existence. They had a, a season ticket holder uh, survey, and yeah. I think they said it was like twenty five percent off the the league or the the merchandise. That's cool. Didn't, like didn't that. the league do one? Yes, I thought. Yeah, that's they what did? I thought. I th- it was early on, like it was one of the first or second years that Chab was in. Yeah, I, I believe. It. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, I don't know what they did. I mean, granted, there, there, you could do one every year and have the the numbers look differently. And then, the 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 issue that I see with having one like a fan engagement is everything has to funnel through that fan. So if I'm the fan that talks to, about, I'm gonna say things that might mean more to me. Whereas you have another fan who's like, well, you need to change the multi point scoring rule, or you're never gonna get any fans, and that just. Are we just not bringing that up? No, I'm gonna keep bringing that every show. No, that's Scotty that's did fine. it though. Scotty, Scotty brought it up, and uh, so it's his fault. Pass the blame. And so I don't <laughs> have like a I don't have a bus noise of somebody getting run over by a bus, but meow. sorry, Scotty. I think the MASL stopped doing the fan engagement surveys once they found out uh, someone gave them five pages of notes. Did who, you do that? Shall remain, shall remain nameless. <laughs> Jesus, hey, we. I would love to play the crunch. I'm just saying. Oh, I did not. I, I would love to to see that. Just just answering that comment. Oh, from Capes Thirteen. Yeah. Um, we had the crunch on. In fact, we, we so crunch fans, we uh, we let you down. We failed you. We did not have the crunch on again at all during the season that they were playing. We had them on before everything was going well, we on. We can get them on because they are champions. But we can get them on. Um, we will we will try to do that. There, I hope. A couple of people on. We want to do a. We want to do some kind of fundraising show, and I don't necessarily know how to go about it. Hey, you know how you were talking about a victory tour? That could be our victory tour. Going back and re-inviting guests. Do I have to leave my room? I don't think so. Do I have to wear pants? Slide over the side. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not to answer that. 
Matt, start start asking off for work now. You got a victory tour to go on. Okay, all right. I'll see what I can. <laughs> Tonight was just a pure pure fluke. I, I couldn't. I can't believe I'm here right now. So it's because you were meant to be. Yeah, it was meant to be. You didn't. You didn't hear the story. Jersey's aligned. Oh, well, the jersey jersey's aligned. So, um, I was supposed to be at work up until like I don't even know what time it is. So, um, ten your time. Uh, to work. I was supposed to be to work. I wasn't even supposed to be here until till later. Um, but my store closed down at five o'clock, um, just just on a on a on a whim. So I got to play volleyball and then be here. That's a what a way to end the night. Jerseys have spoken. The jerseys have spoken. Hey, uh, before you guys leave, uh, in the in the uh, in the MSL fandom out there uh hit the subscribe button and hit the like button in the video because that will get us. well it won't really get us anything but oh so good at this now like i'm pointing down to the right spot remember like a few weeks ago i would sit there and, and, and go like well, this and then in your defense this. though zoom would show a different thing on our screens and it would it would show live now we're no, using this new program it's it's much better than zoom so anyway if you guys didn't see that watch under the corn dog I made that Man. myself. Well, it it's, been, it's been a lovely night. I Ooh, thank you, Keith. Can I make a request real quick? Can we do yeah. the, the uh, Ontario uh, video feed, please? Just Welcome to Ontario International Airport. No, not the, not the airport. Oh, there we go. Yep. That one. But I, I needed to in properly introduce. Oh, yep. It was this uh, one. This one. There you go. What a way to end it. All right. See you guys. Have a good Thank week. Thank you for joining everyone. Thank you, Keith. And look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. Apparently, Mike.